official title we have. painting what he's going to do is like, I'm going to just take this so serious, just do something more, a little bit more abstract, it's easier for you. And then he can explain it that way. And he wouldn't take that. He said, no, I'm not going to do this. So um, he took, took a long time for you to think about it, and I think it's phenomenal what you, what you put up, up on the canvas. Michael's going to introduce Jan, Dr. Jan van der Leeuwen. I'm going to introduce you on more Sure. <laughs> All right. First, first, I'd like to thank Dr. Katarina Powers for putting on this event. I ended the program on Saturday by saying to everybody, all of you made a mistake. You came the wrong evening. You should come when people like Dr. Jan van der Hill shares his knowledge. <laughs> and he is a vice president in charge of Electricity of France Innovation Lab in Los Altos. Correct. And um, he has a PhD in, I believe, waste, nuclear waste. Do you agree? and an undergraduate in hydro... Geology. Geology. So those are heavy topics. <laughs> and I came in contact with him as a result of st what Stanford has done. You know, Stanford spent almost uh, half a billion dollars building a brand new energy system. And I tend to think it's based on technology that is underreported. And no. I think it's tomorrow, Joe Stegner will be here. And he is the father of Stanford's new energy system. So I met Jan as a result of Stanford giving me some documents to help me understand their system. And I saw references and emails to electricity of France. And I discovered that his company was documenting what Stanford did. This painting pulls us together because I sat down and decided to symbolically articulate what Stanford was doing. And my goal was to make a piece of art, as well as events and television programs, mm -hmm. that would further help inform the public, decision makers, political leaders, that there are solutions that we need to embrace. And I'm hoping that the Stanford system will emerge as a visible model for other organizations that have multiple buildings, campus-based systems, or what they refer to as uh, district systems. And you work for a $70 billion in sales company. That's correct. And you have a great interest in helping the United States improve its utilities, improve the electric grid, I think so that your organization can help the utilities provide more clean energy to help the United States economy and maybe some other economies. And with that, it's all yours. Thank you. Thank you. 
Oh. Okay. So my name is Jan van der Lee, and I'm from EDF, which is not the Environmental Defense Fund here, but Electricité de France. Uh, so Michael, he just said, you know, we met. I just wanted to reemphasize how we met, because actually one day I was in my office and someone was ringing, and my assistant, I think she was out for lunch or something, I opened the door. So we have a small office here in Los Altos, of an, an office which is named EDF Innovation Lab, right? We are an outpost of EDF here in the Silicon Valley. Mm -hmm. And I opened the door, I see Michael. And what he, and, and what he says was surprised, surprised me. He said, who are you? <laughs> I, was, I, I, was, I was living, I mean, I work here. <laughs> who are you? He said, well, who are you? <laughs> and I said, well, I'm, Oh, I, perhaps I have to explain. Yes, please. Yeah. I'm Michael Killen. Hey, that name's, yes, he's saying me something. And I'm saying, oh, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm coming, I'm painting and I'm making shows. And I said, suddenly, I know. He was the one who interviewed one of my employees a while ago. So then I said, okay, come in. I had a couple of minutes. You want a cup of coffee? And we sit and we start discussing. He was discussing about this project here. And I said, well, that's very... That's very interesting. I mean, this is, you know, something different. We are solving every day very difficult problems, looking at mathematical methods, at data analytics, having all kinds of technical people around. And he's looking at this from an art perspective. I said, well, that's interesting. So I spent, I think we spent an hour at the end of just explaining and looking. And, and I said, yeah, well, hey, we have to discuss this more. So later I went to his place here in Menlo Park. He showed me this. Uh, this, uh, this painting, and I, was, I think it was a couple of weeks ago. And I said, well, you know, it's all fine, but you know, this turbine, you know, doesn't correspond. This should be connected here. You know, I have a scientific way. So I said, you no, know, this should be connected here. Steam should go there, and then it comes electricity. And I'm very happy that you see, you modified a lot to your painting. <laughs> did not. Everything is connected correctly. <laughs> so actually, this should work. <laughs> It is, it is something which is important for us. How did we came to Stanford? Um, well, first of all, we live here. We know what Stanford is doing. And we're looking at all kinds of uh, approaches to make energy and to make uh, systems more efficient. And also how to reduce CO2 emissions. Because one of our biggest values of EDF as a company is to, is to reduce CO2 emissions and, and help in to limit uh, climate change. And the way we do that in France is that we have a, a almost emission-free generation park because it's mainly nuclear and hydro. And we have uh, other renewables, we have some renewables, but mainly that's our main energy mix. So we have a very specific company, we are, I think, the biggest nuclear utility of the world. We have 160,000 people working at EDF, in, so it's a very big company. And we are all over the world. We are in France, we are the biggest utility in the UK, we are in, in, in Belgium, in Italy, but we are also in China, we are also in the United States. In the United States we have one of the biggest wind and solar energy uh, project developers of the United States. And that's France, EDF. They're based in San Diego. And if you go over the bridge here and you see all these wind turbines, they have been developed by EDF. So it's, a, it's renewable energy here in the States is a very big stake for EDF. But we want to go further because uh, we cannot just provide more uh, renewable energy or clean energy. Uh, there is a lot of other areas, there are a lot of other areas like transportation where you have to act in order to bring CO2 emissions down. So another part of the mission, our mission is all to look at all the other areas. Industry, they use a lot of gas, oil uh, in order to generate their heat they need. So there's a lot of CO2 emissions to, to, to reduce. Buildings, uh, districts, and Stanford is a big district, right? So we thought it was extremely inspiring what Stanford did. So what they basically did, you perhaps, some of you know, but they, they 
they brought in big tanks to store heat and to store cold. And the day you need a lot of heat, uh, instead of just pumping electricity from the grid or firing up some kind of gas turbine in order to heat water, better you use that stored energy from the day before, which was warmed up using the sun, in order to heat the system. The other way around, you need cooling, use electricity when there's an excess of energy because of, for example, solar, and, and cool, and store the, cool, the cold water for the time you need it. So, they kind of optimize this system. Instead of just isolating a building, you can do it at your home, you can isolate your home, etc. That's, that's great. However, if you do this as a campus or as a district size system, you create tremendous amount of energy savings. And in this case, they get rid of all their uh, gas uh, generation assets. So zero CO2 or very low CO2 emissions, which is something we are doing at different scales, but we have never seen and done that at this scale, at the scale of a campus like Stanford, which is a big, big campus. So that was wonderful. So we went there, we've seen it, we did a study on it, and I said, hey, this is interesting. Folks from France, come and see this. I invited my CEO, and he came. And that's where you, you heard of. So he came, he saw this, this is great. We have to do this, you know, more. And he brought over other people from uh, one of our subsidiaries working on this. So. It, you know, one of a campus here in California is really inspiring, even if we're doing this for, a, uh, we, it's really inspiring for a company of us, like us, and uh, we are trying to, now to, to down, because campus is a big, but if you want to do this at a smaller scale, you have to be able to find a business model in order to do it at a smaller scale. Campus, they have deep pockets, right? But if you go to small campus, or to some kind of just an industrial site, they need a different business model. But we can do that because we are a big company. We know about upscaling. We know about infrastructure. We are all over the world, so we can help with that. So that was very inspiring. So that was, for us, a reason to, to go to, to, to Stanford. So, well, I'm not sure about you, what your main motivations are looking at this kind of uh, uh, systems. I mean, how many of you are driving an electric car? One. Okay, let's, another question. How many of you think that your next car will be electric? <laughs> there you go. You see, so there, there, will be, there will be a change. Now, why I'm asking this, because I think, well, we think that electrification is really the next step. So we, we, we are an electricity company, okay? Full disclaimer. Our job is to sell electricity. So if I say we need to electrify everything, of course, this is business for us. But it's not the main reason I'm selling this. It's, I'm telling this story because for me, I'm a scientist. I haven't been at EDF my life. I have been a very a long time. I've been working in a uh, university. I've been a professor and I came to the, uh, to the utility for one reason. Because I thought they were really impactful to work on uh, climate issues and clean, clean environment. And not only CO2 emissions, but also just clean environment. How many of you, you know, have been at LA or some other city and saying, oh, I, you know, I have difficulties to breathe. I've been in China, you have been in Shanghai, you don't see the sun. So if you want to work on this kind, and you want to be impactful, I thought, you know, go to a utility. There is something you can be impactful. But we can do only so much. Because the grid, or the energy coming from the electricity grid, is getting cleaner and cleaner and cleaner. Slowly, but it's getting cleaner. Whatever, if you see what California is currently, 50%, 53% of the energy in California from the grid is renewable energy. So almost without CO2 emissions. So, and this goes forward. Why? Very simple. Coal is getting off the grid. Why? Because gas is cheaper. And gas emits half of the CO2 emissions, CO2 as coal. So it's getting cleaner. And this is the trend. And there's renewables coming on the grid as well. So grid gets cleaner. But you can only do so much. So if you start to electrify, 
So if you start to look at transportation, heavy trucks, boats, perhaps uh, airplanes, but cars, light vehicles, and then heavy trucks, buses, that will really impact enormously, not only climate change, but also your, the quality of your air in the cities, which is hugely important. And it's a very simple step, because going from coal to gas, it's an investment, it's years. Going to nuclear, it's, it's, a, it's a five to 10 years investment to get a plant up and running. Okay, then it's running for 70 or 60 or 80 years. But it's a long investment and a, a huge investment. Electrification of the transport system, everybody can participate in that. So, but it takes time, you know, you're, you, you, you have to start quickly. So what we think is electrification of as much as you can, transport your car, but also in the industry, instead of just using uh, gas in order to heat up your system, you can use heat pumps. So it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's perhaps the most important step we have to make today. So EDF thinks that's the way to go. So we started a big electrification plan, in, but which is mainly focused on transportation. So uh, trains, they will perhaps run on hydrogen because we can create clean hydrogen using solar energy over the day when there's uh, an excess in solar energy. We are going to push for uh, electric vehicles. That means putting infrastructure. We are an infrastructure company, so it makes sense, putting charging stations everywhere. But we're also dealing with the grid. We don't want to have you know, everyone plug in the car at the same time. <laughs> the whole grid will go down. So we have to handle this, but we know how to handle that today. So we're looking at, and one of the reasons we are here in the Silicon Valley is that you are way ahead with regard to this trend of electrification of transport compared to all kinds of France or UK or other parts in, in the world. 10% uh, of all electric car, all cars sold last year in California were electric or, or pluggable electric. And 30% Palo Alto. <laughs> and most of them are Teslas. Why is so? So, so it's, it's, it's a wonderful place to be because we can learn a lot. We are a step ahead here. And so, so that's one of, and, and, and the other reason is that we have so much talent who can help us with that. Stanford is just around the corner. Berkeley is over there. So that's a wonderful place to work. So you see, it really makes sense uh, to come here and even if in France we have a very, I think we are really very, very uh, happy with the energy system we have because it's, it's totally CO2 emission free or almost CO2 emission free. I saw this morning 75% uh, of the electricity produced by nuclear, 18% by hydro, right? And the rest was gas. So that's, that was this morning here, that's the evening there. It's pretty warm currently there, so no, that's, 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 you cannot do much better. But many other things, transportation, 43% in France of the CO2 emissions are due to transportation. I think it's 48% here in California. So that's a pretty big and high focus area, you know. So it, it doesn't make any sense to focus on, if we want to look at priorities, that will be the priority. That would be absolute priority. So going back to your painting here, I think you're symbolized, and uh, I'm not sure if I should enter in the discussion about uh, uh, what kind of artist you are, a fine artist, <laughs> or a primitive, or a symbolic, or a messaging, whatever it is. I, th I, think this, I think what I was inspired by is saying, you know, I want to paint the four goals of Californians' climate change plan. How do you want to paint this? And he just did it. He just did it. And I think this really symbolizes the way uh, uh, you can handle and you can do a very good job in um, pushing forward, combining technology and just common sense. And it is a long-term investment. Stanford can do it, but it really makes sense. In, and I, I also think that you are, uh, you, you very well managed to have here create something which 
allows us to discuss, like me today, yeah. and to discuss about, I think we, are all, uh, uh, agree, we all agree upon key issues for us, for our children and their children, because I know we can deal with a lot of things, but climate change impact is something which is very hard to deal with. So this may help. This is one step. I think, uh, not sure if you are a fine artist, but I think this is fine. <laughs> <laughs> a good message, yeah. well painted. So I think that I will stop here because I would like to give you some time to uh, perhaps ask me a couple of questions. And I will answer these questions with uh, great pleasure. Two questions. Um, you started your talk about electric cars and asked the question of us, who here plans to have Bye. the next vehicle be electric? Some people raise their hands, some people did. I was not one of them who did, because one thing that concerns me are production of batteries and disposal of batteries and the footprint that that leaves and what's being done about that. So I'd like you to address that if you wouldn't mind. That's my first question. My sec second question comes from your acknowledgement of the message painting that Michael has done and obviously your familiarity with your chairman. Are there any projects in France that EDF is doing that would benefit from Michael coming and doing his message painting there? <laughs> <laughs> okay, let me start with the first one. So your, 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 your question is about batteries. There's no such thing as a free lunch, let's put it this way, right? And you're right, because lithium, you have elements you need, you have to build the batteries, it's polluting, it creates CO2 emissions, etc., etc. I would say uh, the balance is globally, of course, much more positive if you, uh, if you look at CO2 emission balance cost le less energy to make a battery store, use it for how long than to uh, just use gas or oil, petrol for your car, right? Uh, first of all, we have looked at a long, we have did a lot of studies on, on battery life, the life of the battery and second life battery use, right? We saw well, all cars will come, their battery will take 10 years, then we have to take them out. How can we reuse them, recycle them? The two things, we can just recycle them. That means you put them all, every piece out of it and you create a new battery. Or you can perhaps just use the battery, stack it and use it for another purpose. Because the cars, they're cycling in a very different way than for example, if you want to use it for massive energy storage on the grid, right? So we looked at all these opportunities and all these possibilities. Uh, what we see today is that there are tremendous opportunities for using uh, used cars from batteries, uh, for used batteries from cars, let's put it this way. The, the, um, the, the point, however, is that with the increased uh, capacity of the batteries, if we look, for example, at Tesla batteries, they simply don't, do not age. They, they age so slowly that we don't think they will be reused before perhaps 10, 20 years. And so, our, so, so, so it's not an, it, we don't think it's really a problem for, uh, you, you can reuse the battery once that Tesla owner doesn't want to use its battery anymore because it went to, for example, 85% of its capacity. But it could be largely enough for someone else who doesn't use their car so much and they don't need the full capacity of the car. And they can charge easily at home because they use it only for 30 miles per day or 20 miles per day. So my, my feeling is the batteries of the car is really not an issue anymore today. And it, it's getting cheaper and cheaper. That's just because of the scaling of the, of the but there will be st stress on, on the materials you need for, for that at the end. So the other issues, the only thing I really want to stress, and I think perhaps that's the most important part is, I think these are all issues. It's like radioactive waste. He just mentioned, I spent 10 years working on radioactive waste, I think 15 years. The problem of radioactive waste is something we can deal with. Scientists can deal with. We know how to measure. It's, we know how to measure radioactivity. We know where to put it and how to deal with it. Climate change, we have no idea how to deal with that. There's no way how you can deal with this problem. I think we can deal with, in Holland we can deal with it because we are hydraulic engineers. We are born hydraulic engineers there. So, 
that's not a problem. But those people in Bangladesh, they will not know how to deal with that. All these islands who will just get drowned on the 80 meters of... So it's simply something you cannot deal with. And I don't want to give... I prefer to give a battery problem to my, kill, to my kids. Joe's sitting there. He's my son. He will deal with... I know he can deal with that problem. But he will... I don't want to give them a, a climate change problem. That's, I think, the key. Now, with regard to the other question, uh, so I think he was already asking me this question. Can I paint the energy? So we just, uh, it was just published, the energy plan for uh, France by our government. Well, it's a very complex. It's not a four-goal plan, so it will be a, a, a tremendous problem to paint. However, there are a couple of things you can start painting. Look at nuclear, for example. Really, a uh, nuclear is something we really believe very strongly in, and it has uh, a very big, uh, it, it, there's a huge advantage in using nuclear, and we know how to deal with it in France, and it's something very typical for France, uh, for the French energy system. We have to build new nuclear power plants, and there is still a lot of question how you can reduce uh, cost and acceptance of that. Having an artist looking at this in an artistic way. We have had a very good photographer looking at very his artistic way to look at, uh, at energy generation. And we use these photos everywhere. So having an artist looking at it could also perhaps be a communication vector of interest for us. So I already uh, promised you to, to, to put you in contact with the... Uh, with uh, one of the, uh, the folks here, in, uh, of the um, ambassadors here in, uh, in San Francisco, and we'll discuss what is uh, really possible. Uh, I will perhaps. For the Stanford Energy Savings System, who came up with the concept? And is it used somewhere else on the planet? Or is it just unique? No, no, it's, it's used, it's used uh, in many places. However, as I said, the, the nice thing here is it everything is in there at a pretty large scale and very nicely connected and managed by one central system which is uh, which is their uh, their intelligence and there's a lot of uh, artificial intelligence going in there you know really a Stanford thing and we we're doing a lot of these elements but separately so for example reusing heat we're doing that everywhere uh, as my well as a company it's, it's one of the core businesses of Dalkia, which is one of our, our big uh, subsidiaries here. Uh, so reusing coal, it's a little bit more difficult, but you know, combining these two and, and putting this in a system. The other thing is, they're really providing a service to the grid. And I'm pretty sure that Joe will <coughs> talk about that tomorrow. They're providing a service to the grid in the sense that during very hot days, like we had in July last, last year, uh, we know that because we do, do, we do some clever weather forecasting, so we know hey, tomorrow it will become you know, 112 degrees or something like that. Mm -hmm. uh, so we will need a lot of energy for cooling down, uh, and, 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 and pg and &E needs a lot of energy because everyone puts their uh, cooler uh, to uh, to higher level. Mm -hmm. So what they do is, okay, we store today, we store much more cold, so tomorrow we don't need that. And they, they bring down their energy and they provide a service to PGD and they pay them for it. Mm -hmm. That's another way your system gets, you can pay back for the system. So it's, it's really a win-win situation for everyone. We cannot, uh, perhaps we want to have energy all the time, every time, same quality. It's perhaps something our chil children will not have access to. They just choose. We run our washing machine only this part of the day, and some point, sometime of the day we don't have energy. Perhaps we, this become acceptable. Now I'm looking at the future, sorry. But uh, I think the, the whole, the hell, the trend will go in, in a more distributed, more and more distributed, organized way. I think we have to look at the future. I mean, uh, I think this is a crisis, and the scientists globally are saying, we have 12 or 15 years, and then after that, it's going to be extremely difficult for people to survive, especially in places, in, uh, in underdeveloped places and islands. And so yeah, no. So the 12 years is interesting, but I'm going over time. I see my timekeeper there. But just one thing, 12 years, 12, where does the number 12 come from? I think you mentioned the system is finite, right? CO2 emissions 
it's not about how much you, 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 you push in the, in, the, in the atmosphere every day. It's how much has been put in the atmosphere. How much, at some point, it's full. Which is what we call the, CO, the, uh, the CO2 budget we have. So if you want to keep the climate change, again, I'm not a climate change expert, but if you, put, if you want to stay below 1.5 degrees uh, increase in temperature of the global uh, temperature, I think there are 12 years to go, given the rate we are currently emitting CO2 this year, right? So in 12 years, and you stop all emissions after 12 years, you will not go above 1.5 degrees. That's impossible, right? That's impossible because we're increasing currently. The economy is going up, we're increasing, so that's impossible. So we're going a little bit higher, perhaps much higher. We don't know. Uh, is that the end of the world? Of course not. Is that the end of a part of humanity? Yeah, of course. Uh, what do you want to do? That's it. So we have to. <laughs> so that's the that's that's the reality. But it's not the end of the world. It's just it's just uh, but it, it's just the, the start of a whole whole other way. Thank you. Very Thank you. Very skillful. Thank you for all the plugs. And, yeah, and then they oh, loved it. Well, right? no, that's okay. I'd like to thank Dr. Katarina Powers for putting on this event and, and her love of art and how she puts demands on me. You know, for example, she said, let's put this here and we'll have one speaker evening. And then all of a sudden she says, can you get somebody from Stanford to speak? I said, yes. Can you get somebody from NASA? You know, I easily could do that, but you know. <laughs> Can you get somebody, some political leader to speak? And as I think you know, if you've looked at the schedule, we have the mayor of Menlo Park, we have the former mayor of, of Palo Alto, and I believe the former mayor of Atherton is also going to come. And then we have some heavies like uh, Rapu Malahotra, who is a expert in energy systems, and we have the same with Alex Canara. Jim Caldwell is also into this. We have, so we have a lot of, uh, a lot of interesting people.